for the meeting. All right. Let's go ahead and get started, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. This is the VCU Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, this is a special session hosted by uh, the Division of Cardiology. This is the George and Francis Broadus Crutchfield Lecture that we run uh, every year. To get us started, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. George Vetrovec up here to uh, talk about the Crutchfield Lecture Series and also introduce our speaker today, Dr. Greg, uh, George um, Gregory Lewis. Dr. Vetrovec has been uh, here at VCU since 1976. Uh, he achieved a full rank of professor in 1986 and has a long distinguished uh, record here at VCU and the Poly Heart Center. He was elected to AOA as a faculty member in 1986, served as the chairman of cardiology for 18 years, director of the adult cardiac cath lab for 38 years, and was associate chairman of medicine for clinical affairs for 23 years. In September, 2015, Dr. Vetrovic retired He's currently Professor Emeritus here at VCU, continues lecturing, serves on the MCV Foundation Board and the Pauli Heart Center Board and the MCV Physician Board. Dr. Vetrovec, we'd like to invite you up here to give some remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker, but first I want to make a couple of comments about the uh, okay <laughs> It's my pleasure today to at least give a little background on the Crutchfield uh, lectureship. Um, George Crutchfield was the head of mass communications at VCU for nearly 20 years, was particularly strong in the print media area, and uh, was very, um, was honored by many awards from the Virginia Press Association and the like. Um, he was always interested in heart disease, and uh, uh, after his death, his family and his honor uh, created this uh, uh, lecture series, particularly focusing on uh, Dr. Mike Hess, who was here for many years and was very close to the Crutchfields. So um, it's a real pleasure and honor to be able to uh, see this being used for uh, important uh, education within our institution, which is what George would have wanted. Um, it's my pleasure to also introduce Dr. Gregory Lewis, who will be our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Lewis is a professor at Harvard. He uh, directs the uh, clinical transplant uh, program uh, uh, at uh, Mass General along with the heart failure program and has a special interest in uh, exercise physiology related to uh, cardiovascular disease. He's well published and he will give us his uh, perspectives on uh, how we uh, utilize some of this uh, exercise technology and better understanding and managing uh, heart disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, I appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, I do feel a, a affinity to say a word about Dr. Hess, who was uh, Professor Crutchfield's uh, physician, uh, was actually the founder, as maybe you know, of the International Society of Heart Lung Transplant. And so I, it's, it's a real you know, pleasure to be here today um, for this lecture. So I spoke this morning at Cardiology Grand Rounds. I know for some of you that were here, there's minimal overlap between these uh, talks. I thought for this uh, conference, I would focus on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction from a more kind of global uh, perspective here. Uh, these are research grants uh, that are made uh, with uh, my institution, not me personally, uh, for work that I do. So uh, heart failure has really a staggering societal burden. About 2% of the US population, over a million hospitalizations. Number one reason why people over the age of 65 are hospitalized. Uh, 
as many of you know very well, and unfortunately it's a, a condition that is on the rise in terms of prevalence as we become better at taking care of other cardiovascular conditions that tend to culminate in heart failure. Uh, and uh, approximately half of heart failure is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We'll talk a little bit about uh, diagnostic considerations, mechanisms that drive heart failure preserved DF, and then we'll focus on you know, thinking about the management of this condition uh, in 2024. So starting with, with uh, what is heart failure preserved ejection fraction, you know, here are various societal definitions. Uh, you can see the American College of Cardiology and AHA, European Society of Cardiology, Heart Failure Society of America, all have quite distinct definitions of how we even determine whether one patient either has or doesn't have this condition. Of course, the only thing that's in common for all of these is symptoms, and the symptoms tend to be nonspecific, things like shortness of breath, um, even edema, right, is not specific to a, to a uh, heart failure condition. Uh, various reliance on uh, echocardiographic criteria, various reliance on biomarker criteria, and you can see different cut points, the natural peptide levels tend to be um, not as elevated in heart failure preserved EF, particularly in obese heart failure preserved EF. So it becomes difficult to kind of get our arms around which patients have heart failure preserved EF and which patients don't have it, particularly since we're largely defining something on the basis of what it's not, right? This is patients who do not have low ejection fraction heart failure. Uh, and so it invites in a lot of other potential conditions and a, a very distinct from other conditions where you can you know, look at electrocardiogram and say, this patient has an ST elevation MI, or this patient has ventricular tachycardia. This is more of a, I don't know, within the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds lecture, something that you might think about like a rheumatologic condition or something, right? Where you have to pull in different uh, testing modalities and symptoms and signs uh, to decide who has heart failure and who doesn't. So um, Michelle Kittleson and colleagues in a recent publication tried to distill this down a little bit um, by saying, if we want to conclude that somebody has heart failure, with preserved ejection fraction, we want there to be something structural with the heart uh, that's abnormal, but it isn't always structure. It can be structure or function. So either the heart is filling at an estimated elevation and filling pressure, or there's some structural abnormality like left atrial enlargement, and then something else that's a barometer, uh, such as NT pro BNP levels, evidence of pulmonary edema on a chest X ray, evidence of an increase in filling pressures in the left heart. This combination of two things uh, in terms of ruling in the definite the diagnosis of heart failure. Uh, and then there's various scores. I don't know how much these are being used uh, in the, you know, among the internists uh, here. I think there's been various kind of uh, penetration of these. And some of them kind of stand to reason. If you look at this uh, H2 PEF score, uh, you get two points if you have a BMI in excess of 30 three points for atrial fibrillation, and then you can see the, the age uh, earns you another point in these other barometers from an echo. Um, and then there's other uh, scoring systems that can be made that can essentially be designed to rule in uh, the presence of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I think one of the things that's important, and I apologize, this is a busy slide, uh, they'll get less busy as I go, is to really put our kind of internal medicine uh, caps on when we're taking care of these patients because uh, we see that that a lot of different conditions that have specific treatments, and I think that's an important thing to focus on, um, can look like this kind of garden variety heart failure preserved ejection fraction. I think as many of you know, we're um, picking up more and more patients that have cardiac amyloidosis now, uh, particularly with the POIP scans. Um, and of course, there's treatments that are currently available that are quite effective uh, to treat this condition. So it's important not to overlook it. Um, Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an extremely exciting field right now, uh, particularly uh, with the emerging data on the cardiac myosin inhibitors for uh, obstructive uh, HCM. Cardiac sarcoidosis has been advances in management uh, and so on down the line here. So I think it's important to cast a broad net when we see these patients in order to look for things that would change the management of the patient uh, if we end up ruling in the diagnosis um, in terms of these uh, kind of alternative etiologies. 
But in terms of the, the patient who doesn't have amyloid or doesn't have HCM, but does develop this uh, syndrome of heart failure preserved ejection fraction, why does it come about? What are the mechanisms that, that drive uh, development of heart failure preserved ejection fraction? And there's been various hypotheses that have been advanced over the years. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, Jim Fang you know, wrote about this concept of maybe heart failure preserved ejection fraction isn't a primary problem with the heart itself. Uh, this could be patients that have underlying renal dysfunction. Uh, they retain salt and water as a result. And then some of the things that we're seeing in the heart you know, are secondary phenomena from uh, having underlying chronic kidney disease. Um, others have postulated this kind of metabolic uh, derangement that leads to heart failure preserved ejection fraction where you have obesity, you have maldistribution of fat, fat around the uh, in the epicardial space, um, you have underlying diabetes, and this kind of multiple metabolic uh, hit hypothesis leads to this state of hemodynamic constraint on the heart from increased epicardial fat uh, and increased visceral fat. And indeed, if you look in epidemiologic studies, um, this distribution pattern, this maldistribution of fat is a major risk factor for the future development of heart failure preserved ejection fraction. In contrast to reduced EF, we typically think about a, um, an insult that occurred directly to the heart, right? The patient had a myocardial infarction, the patient had myocarditis, the patient had a, you know, a dilated cardiomyopathy from some toxic exposure. And so this is a very distinct condition in terms of the origins of heart failure preserved EF. And of course, I think some of our hypotheses around the etiology of heart failure preserved EF have been challenged by the fact that we haven't had effective therapies uh, yeah. until recently in order to treat this condition. Uh, recently, we've seen the, the emergence of the SLT2 inhibitors uh, that have been shown to benefit these patients with heart failure preserved EF, though I would argue it doesn't necessarily get us any closer to the primacy of the mechanism, right? Because they seem to work on everything, right? In terms of the protection of the kidneys and obviously they're developed to counter diabetes. They actually shrink epicardial fat uh, way out of proportion to the uh, degree to which you see reduction in body mass. Um, so, so really, uh, I don't know that we've learned more uh, there and then even the GLP-1 agonists, I think have multiple mechanisms by which they're working um, in terms of these patients to understand through um, mechanisms that are essentially prioritized by the pharmacologic therapies that are effective, uh, perhaps we've gotten a little bit closer here in terms of this metabolic hypothesis. Uh, but one of the things that is a major driver and actually a, more so a driver of, pre of preserved EF heart failure than reduced EF is the uh, exposure to physical activity over the life course. You can see here the, the hazard ratios fall as you get to more and more uh, leisure time physical activity, particularly for the preserved EF population. This is in a very large study of over 50,000 individuals. Um, and we put together this uh, paper a couple of years ago in terms of this concept of heart failure preserved EF as an exercise deficiency syndrome. You know, when patients do not have uh, chronic exposure to physical activity, uh, you see smaller heart volume, you see lower compliance of the heart, and you see the highest risk of development of heart failure preserved EF. Conversely, you know, the person that is highly physically active has uh, larger heart chambers, higher uh, compliance of the heart, and of course the regular physical activity can help to counteract some of the interaction with the distribution of fat uh, in patients with heart failure preserved EF as well. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about some of the molecular mechanisms, uh, this is a, a polis paradigm uh, that has evolved over the years. And uh, basically, there's the hemodynamic load pictured here. I have a pointer here, yeah. Um, whether that be from hypertension, aortic stenosis, coupled with this metabolic load that we've been talking about with obesity and diabetes, uh, this pro inflammatory process, which I know is something that's been um, expertly studied here at BCU, uh, ultimately leading to hypophosphorylation of titan, increased myocardial stiffness, increased fibrosis in the heart, 
um, and in some cases, this accumulation of degraded proteins uh, contributing to this abnormal uh, diastole. And so I think we're still learning. There's all kinds of other uh, hypotheses out there about microvascular rarefaction. I think, honestly, doing careful animal model work like Fatty does is going to be really important to further understand mechanisms that drive uh, heart failure preserved ejection fraction. And in the meantime, we're trying very hard as a community to uh, come up with ways to treat this condition because up until recently, it hasn't been uh, a successful endeavor. This is, uh, if we rewind the clock 10 years ago and we look at what are the therapies that are available as of 2014 that change outcomes uh, over a period of two years uh, in patients with heart failure reduced EF. And you can see there's a whole host of different uh, pharmacotherapies, device therapies that improve two-year survival in HEF-REF. In 2014, this is not an animated slide. This is what we had for HEF-PEF that actually <laughs> changed <laughs> outcomes uh, as of one decade ago. Uh, so really the stark contrast, right, between these two conditions. And yet, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, right now we're, we're looking at about a 50-50 split of the number of people that have the two conditions. So this was an NIH-sponsored study that happened to be published right around that 10-year that mark uh, ago now, the TopCat study. It took a long time to enroll, uh, 4,500 patients uh, in total, ejection fraction in excess of 45%. Um, and you can see here that there was some separation, uh, modest separation for sure, in terms of the spironolactone versus the placebo group with uh, MRA therapy here, did not reach statistical significance. You can see the hazard ratio did cross uh, one at 0.89. Um, so some suggestion here, and then um, some subsequent analysis, there was enrollment of patients in Russia and Georgia that didn't have heart failure, that didn't help. Um, but there was also this, I think, interesting analysis that Scott Solomon led, uh, looking at what if we break down these patients into different kind of strata of their ejection fraction. And you can see the patients that look a bit more like the reduced EF patients who we know respond very well to MRAs, uh, they seem to de derive benefit up to about an ejection fraction of 55%, which is where this confidence interval begins to cross one in terms of the benefit from, uh, from spironolactone. And this was true for the combined outcome. This is true for heart failure hospitalization. It's hard to, to move the dial on mortality uh, based on all the comorbidity and heart failure preserved EF. And then if we look at subsequent studies that pooled uh, various studies looking at careful echocardiographic indices, you can see that the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists do have some modest effects on cardiac structure and function. Left atrial volume goes down, LV mass goes down, thickness sli is slightly reduced, and E over E prime is reduced. And so we think that these are uh, quite reasonable therapies for patients who will tolerate them, who won't uh, develop hyperkalemia. And there's the non steroidal MRAs that are uh, going to be in the pipeline right now, uh, promising data from Figaro CKD, uh, looking at reduction in new onset heart failure. The fine arts trial, over 6,000 patients, primary out out outcome is CV death or heart failure event. And this is uh, close to reporting, um, which there's a lot of excitement about in terms of the evolution of the MRAs uh, for these patients. So we think that there uh, may be a role for the spironolactone uh, or plerinone in the treatment of heart failure preserved EF. What about Entresto? We've seen Entresto have a dramatic effect in the HEFREF population. You can see a not dissimilar result uh, to TopCat uh, when you control, when you compare Secubitra Valsartan to Valsartan alone um, with the rate ratio of 0.85 and the p-value narrowly missing 0.05 uh, for total hospitalizations for heart failure and death from cardiovascular causes uh, in a large HEFPEF study uh, that randomized patients to either Valsartan or Secubitra Valsartan. And you can see, again, Scott did a similar analysis here, similar uh, effects if you pool the reduced EF and the preserved EF patients uh, from Paragon and Paradigm. You can see that across the board, the, uh, there's greater benefit in reduced EF uh, patients compared to preserved ejection fraction patients. But you can see that, that most of these are falling at least you know, to the left of uh, 
1.0 here for the PEF population. And again, right up to about an ejection fraction of 55%, you can see that's where these lines cross uh, one at the 95% upper confidence interval. So we think that that the uh, interest may have a role for these patients that have these uh, um, ejection fractions below 55%. And then we move into the SGLT2 inhibitors. So for these patients, if you look at these different strata, you don't see the same uh, impact that we see with the with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system antagonism. But your ejection fraction 60% or more, you know, in the mid-range of uh, 50 to 59 or or 41 to 49, um, you see almost identical effects in terms of the outcomes. And this was a pooled analysis of the deliver. In the emperor studies, so looking at both dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Um, so we think that the uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors they were isolated actually from uh, from the uh, bark of apple trees in 1933 and uh, observed to cause glucosuria. So we were pretty close with our apple a day keeping the doctor away. It just seems like it was the bark more than the apple for for the SGLT2 inhibitors. But in, in, in uh, seriousness, we're still kind of trying to understand how these work um, in terms of the multiplicity of effects uh, beyond just spilling more glucose into the urine in terms of renal protection, uh, the making uh, ketones bioavailable to the heart uh, as a potential advantageous fuel source. Um, but in reality, we kind of stumbled upon this right through the diabetes safety studies that mandated the uh, the trial of these drugs for approval to make sure they didn't cause adverse cardiovascular outcomes. And lo and behold, they did um, uh, help our patients that have uh, the whole spectrum of heart failure. So, you know, it's interesting. We Here we are in 2024, 10 years after we felt that these two conditions were just worlds apart, right? We tried to repurpose some of the REF therapies for uh, PEF initially, but we didn't have much success. And now, you know, we've converged on this four pillars of heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And things don't look all that dissimilar, at least for the EF less than 55 uh, initial portion of the EF spectrum in, in preserved EF patients. Um, true for ARNI, true for MRAs, the SGLT2 inhibitors are across heart failure. Beta blockers, as I'll get into in a moment, are a bit of a different story. We don't have any uh, evidence that beta blockers in the, in the completely preserved ejection fraction population um, have a significant role. But in some ways, uh, heart failure therapy is becoming somewhat simplified. We still are a bit uncertain. You saw the directionality of those hazard curves as you start to get into this EF 60, 65, 70% um, in terms of what, what, what the best way of managing those patients are um, in terms of pharmacotherapies. So um, that was a very quick kind of tour of, of where we are with heart failure preserved EF kind of pharmacotherapy across the, the spectrum of HEF-PEF. But I think that, that this patient population has quite a bit of heterogeneity in it. And one of the primary symptoms of heart failure preserved ejection practice mm -hmm. is exercise intolerance. And so in terms of understanding mechanisms of why these patients have difficulty with exercise, uh, is one way for us to, to improve how we define the condition and how we uh, subphenotype the condition to uh, hopefully make further inroads into treatment. If we think about the metabolic costs of different activities, we looked across 14 studies in which uh, exercise capacity as measured by peak oxygen uptake was actually measured, uh, 14 HEFPEF studies. And you can see on average, it came out to be about 15 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And importantly, you can see anaerobic threshold is far below that. You can then look at this, what patients can afford relative to the metabolic costs of these various activities. And you can see that these patients are oftentimes, you know, right up against their ceiling in terms of what they can afford metabolically, uh, even to be functionally independent or to do something like carry their groceries. And so this is a major uh, concern for our patients, whether they're uh, optovolemic uh, or not. And you can see it also correlates with poor outcomes when you start to have a, uh, the lower and lower PPO2s. So in terms of thinking about inroads, I spoke this morning um, about some uh, interventions with hemodynamic consequences. I'm going to speak uh, this afternoon a little bit of particularly about the role of obesity 
and counteracting obesity and how that interfaces with HEFBEF. And we'll talk a little bit about the heart rate and the periphery as well. Um, so this is our setup at MGH. Apologies for those that have already seen it in terms of the uh, comprehensive exercise testing, which if we go back to the origins of heart failure preserved EF, we're talking about this systemic condition. It arises in the setting of uh, abnormal metabolism, obesity, diabetes. These are things uh, that don't spare the rest of the body, right? These are not isolated uh, myocardial infarctions to the LAD, right? That result in a uh, singular insult to the heart. And so, and, and importantly, we see differential involvement of the multiple organ systems in terms of the comorbidities that patients bring with them at the time that they acquire this diagnosis of heart failure preserved EF. So if we're going to understand what the physiologic limitations are to these patients, the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to measure them and to measure them all simultaneously and carefully and then put them into some form of rank order that can then permit us to try to chip away at them in the order in which they're predominant in causing limitation. Otherwise, I think we can try to address one thing and it's not gonna be sufficient uh, to result in an overall improvement in, in functional capacity. So we perform these tests, um, over 200 of them a year where we uh, have patients come in for exercise. We try to do this test once. This isn't something we do every time patients come in but if somebody has dyspnea on exertion, they're symptomatic, they've typically had multiple tests done already, echocardiograms, oftentimes trips to the cath lab for coronary angiography, regular stress tests. And here, what we wanna do is to map out, you know, the kind of entirety of their, of their oxygen pathway here. And so we, we perform exercise with a pulmonary arterial catheter in place, radio arterial catheter, uh, first pass imaging, and we measure metabolic rate and then we can derive minute by minute cardiac outputs and filling pressures. And so the first thing, which is a simple thing that does, you certainly don't need a, that complex uh, exercise test for is, is heart rate response. And we know that HFPEF is associated with a blunted uh, response in heart rate. Um, and we know that this blunted response is differentially distributed across HFPEF. Some patients will have a normal heart rate response exercise and some will not. And the only way that we will know who's in which category is to actually measure their heart rate response to exercise. Uh, we can't have somebody in our exam room that's saying that they're short of breath with activity and somehow figure out what, you know, what their heart rate response is when they're trying to carry their groceries up the, up the flight of stairs. And yet the vast majority of patients with HEFPAF out there have never had an exercise test. Um, so I think measuring heart rate is important. Uh, it just came from a, a DSMB meeting for this trial block, HEFPEF, which is going to look at beta blockers uh, and randomized form uh, crossover design beta blockers or and lodipine with no heart rate effects and to see what the effect is on exercise capacity. Mm -hmm. But we know from if you give patients a Vavardine to lower heart rate, they have worse exercise capacity. If you take away beta blockers when they don't have an indication their exercise capacity tends to improve. So we think that the heart rate response exercise is one potential avenue to intervene on a subset of these patients. Um, in terms of the periphery with skeletal muscle oxygen utilization, I mentioned the iron trial that we're doing this morning. Um, the periphery is impaired in patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction. They don't extract oxygen as well as their uh, normal controls or even as well as patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction. Um, iron is intriguing because it obviously can affect hemoglobin levels, but it can also affect oxygen storage in skeletal muscle. And it also is an obligate component of our aerobic enzymes uh, that permit O2 utilization in the periphery. And there's some central hemodynamic effects as well. Um, we know from our uh, experience with heart failure reduced ejection fraction that none of those like uh, pillars of therapy that I mentioned really move the dial much on exercise capacity, right? Beta blockers don't. SGLT2 inhibitors don't, uh, ACE inhibitors don't, ARNIs don't. And so these are therapies that, of course, are very important for REF and for a subset of HEF PEF patients because they'll make people live longer and therefore we should be prioritizing their use in our clinics. But a lot of these patients also want to be able to go out to their mailbox and get their mail or, you know, climb up a flight of stairs. 
And so that is, you know, one of the reasons there's been a lot of interest in our group in, in the utilization of IV iron. The studies I've shown here are all in reduced EF patients. Um, but you can see that there's a pretty consistent uh, effect in terms of improving exercise capacity when you treat patients with reduced EF uh, with iron. And there's also this consistent improvement in quality of life scores by, as measured by the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. Um, so this is in the preserved, I'm sorry, the reduced ejection fraction population. We've been interested in moving this into the preserved EF uh, patient population. So we're doing a small study at MGH, two to one randomization, single dose ferroduroxymaltose, uh, um, where you can essentially achieve repletion uh, in the vast majority of patients with one dose of this medication. And importantly, if we look at like the, the, the prevalence of iron deficiency as measured by a ferritin level less than 100 or a ferritin level less than 300 with a transfer saturation less than 20%, exact definition used in clinical trials, it's actually more common uh, to see iron deficiency by that definition in the preserved EF population than it is in the reduced EF population. And these patients actually tend to have more impairment in peripheral oxygen utilization than REF does. So, you know, that that's what drove the kind of logic behind uh, testing this intervention uh, in the preserved EF uh, patient population. So that study's ongoing. But in the meantime, we're, we've been trying to learn from the reduced EF population. Um, it was part of this, the HeartFit trial that just resulted uh, within the last year. And this was the largest trial of, of iron, IV iron therapy uh, to be conducted to, to date. We've enrolled about half the patients in the US. And so we've had a chance to look back at these iron studies. So I think this is relevant to, I'm sure iron studies I know are being done a lot more frequently now at, at uh, my hospital. I imagine they're being done a lot more frequently here too. And, you know, it's great that we have a marker in the bloodstream that we can measure, right? If we think about like, you know, use of MRAs, apart from maybe like the toxicity of high potassium, we don't have like a target measurement that we can send a blood test and say, your MRA activity is essentially normalizing your renin angiotensin aldosterone system signaling, right? We do have these iron measures, which is great. You know, we can say, oh, look, your iron level is X. We're going to give you back some iron IV, the oral iron doesn't work so well, we tried that. Um, and we're gonna boost your iron levels up and then we're gonna you know, declare victory, right? Because your ferritin level went up by 200 points. The problem is that when we look at, the, at all the data from HeartFed, that the ferritin is a pretty lousy marker of iron status. Um, within these patients, we enrolled just over 3000 patients, but this analysis was confined to those that had complete data for six minute walk, complete data for iron studies. So it's just, so it's slightly lower population, but it, it really interesting. This is data that we're gonna be presenting next week at ACC, but you can see that the ferritin levels, if you had a ferritin less than hundred, you were no more likely to have a low hemoglobin. Even if your ferritin level was less than 30, your hemoglobin was actually only slightly lower. Your six minute walk distance was actually higher in the low ferritin group and your outcomes uh, in terms of death or CV hospitalization were actually better if your ferritin level was low. And so, and then, you know, the TSAT and the actual uh, iron measurements that we don't tend to pay as, uh, much attention to performed exactly how you might expect them to, right? Lower TSAT, lower iron levels, lower hemoglobin levels, lower six minute walk distance, more likely to be NYHA 3, 4, and more likely to have an adverse event. So these seem to be, uh, you know, markers that that move in the direction that you would expect them to. And importantly, when you subject half this patient population to IV iron, you see an improvement in hemoglobin level and an improvement in six-minute walk test that's proportional to the improvements in TSAT and iron, not the case for ferritin. So I think what's happening is this pro-inflammatory state of HEPFEF, again, something that I know has been, been uh, very well investigated here, uh, the same thing that leads to the high hepcidin levels and the blockade of the absorption of iron likely leads to excess release of ferritin from the pool of ferritin that's intracellular that's a thousand times larger than the pool that circulates. And all you need to do is nudge a little bit more of that ferritin into the circulation in a state of pro-inflammation. And that's what we're measuring with our serum ferritin levels, not 
uh, iron status. Um, so anyways, I think the definitions that we use for iron deficiency are subject to shift a bit. And I think we'll probably end up focusing more on TSAT and iron and less on ferritin, but this is def this is kind of a story in, in evolution. Um, we're doing okay on time, right? At 12.50, I'll, I'll stop. So I'm gonna talk now about obesity uh, in terms of high BMI and, and use of obesity as a target for patients with HFPEF. So if we think about the interventions, uh, you know, th these have really come a long way uh, recently. You know, we, not too long ago, we had like things like Orlistat and that was about it. And now with the GLP-1 agonists, um, with, uh, with additional kind of combination therapies with improved uh, surgical methods um, for surgical weight loss interventions, you can see that we're seeing, you know, really quite, uh, remarkable reductions in body mass uh, in patients. And these are starting to be applied within the uh, heart failure preserved ejection fraction population. Um, I showed this slide this morning. Basically, when we do exercise tests, we can try to tease out the, the metabolic costs of being uh, overweight. Um, and in these patients that have a very exaggerated metabolic cost of just moving their heavy legs, um, these are patients that we've actually been targeting for um, weight loss. And when these patients undergo gastric sleeve intervention, uh, we see that this internal work measurement or this metabolic cost of exercise initiation goes way down. This is a, a study that's in progress, but it's a, it's a non-randomized uh, kind of open label study where we're just trying to learn from uh, how weight uh, change affects exercise uh, physiology. And we see this very tight relationship between how much weight somebody loses and how much this initial kind of metabolic cost of exercise changes. And then we know from the pharmacotherapy studies with the GLP-1 agonists, sorry that this is a little bit small here, but the semaglutide is here, placebo is here. And you can see we're seeing this dramatic uh, weight loss. And in that context, quality of life scores go up and the six minute walk distance goes up. And so, you know, we're seeing that the weight loss does translate into improved, uh, you know, uh, quality of life and improved exercise capacity. We also, and this obviously was well, well, you know, known and recognized from the uh, trial uh, step half half in the New England Journal. Uh, perhaps less well recognized is what happens with the SLT2 inhibitors. So there's been multiple trials done. Imperial Preserved was done mostly in Europe, mostly with BMI less than 30 FF patients. Determined was done, never published, but the results are on clinicaltrials.gov. And Determined had neither of these trials changed uh, walk distance at all with HFPEF. Um, conversely, we did the preserved HFPEF trial here in the US, so call this like US HFPEF, um, and the average, uh, the median BMI was 35, um, and so this is a distinct HFPEF population. And what we found was that the six minute walk test distance actually improved in what we can call American HFPEF. Um, and you can see when we did a responder analysis here that the improvement in 15, uh, of 15 meters or more um, in these patients was more likely in the dapagliflozin group and the deterioration was less likely. And so all this kind of fits. But interestingly, when we break down the responder analysis further, you can see that it was actually diabetics with BMIs above the median. So now we're starting to get up into like, you know, BMI 40 category. And you can see they had 36 meter increases in their walk distance, as opposed to those that didn't have no, no diabetes and the lower BMI uh, did not have a response. So we're still trying to understand this, but I think it's uh, clearly there's a relationship between this metabolic uh, disease, excess body weight, excess fat, um, and uh, likelihood of um, having impairment in functional capacity for sure, and then having potential reversal of that. We also know from the SELECT trial, and this was a, not a heart failure trial per se, but you can see they enrolled over 17,000 patients, um, and BMI was had to be over 27. Um, and these patients actually had a substantial subgroup that did have uh, heart failure. Um, we don't have the breakdown, at least I don't, of the 
uh, of the ejection fraction strata, uh, but there was over 4,000 patients with heart failure in this study, and the semaglutide versus placebo was a, a markedly positive study. You can see the hazard ratio was 0 0.80 for the overall study population. And if we look in this chronic heart failure subgroup, if anything, the point estimate of the hazard ratio, it was 0 0.72 in those with heart failure. Um, so we're still awaiting the kind of the outcomes uh, trials with the uh, GLP-1 agonists. There were some early signals of potential concern with the very low ejection fraction heart failure patients, like in the FIGHT trial. Uh, but this, this was certainly quite promising in terms of what the future holds uh, for the, for the uh, heart failure population. There are side effects in terms of predominantly gastrointestinal side effects of these GLP-1 right. agonists. And importantly, you know, we, we can ask this question about what are these drugs? Is there something particularly special about them beyond the fact that there's lose that there's weight loss associated? You know, what if we have an equivalent amount of dietary weight loss? And um, Delane Kitzman, who I know gave this lecture a, a couple of years ago, um, did a very nice study with 100 patients with, with diet and exercise. And interestingly, very closely matched patient populations in terms of the age and the weight and the BMI. Um, and with a 7% weight loss in this study, there was improvement in KCCQ that was similar, improvement in six minute walk distance that was similar, uh, improvement in CRP levels that was similar with the weight loss. Um, we don't know because they didn't measure NT pro BMP, but there is this intriguing signal despite losing weight, the NT pro went down with the GLP 1 agonist. So I think it's still kind of to be determined in terms of how much is there a unique um, mechanism by which there's cardioprotection with these drugs, or are we purely seeing the effects of weight loss here? Um, we're interested in studying metabolic accelerators. Uh, this is one HU6, um, which has recently been published in the, uh, in the hepatic steatosis literature. And you can see there was in this particular case, a disproportionate loss of fat relative to loss of lean muscle mass which is what we really want to get to in these patients, right? Because if you give someone a GLP-1 agonist, they're going to lose weight, but they're going to lose a proportional amount of fat mass and lean muscle mass. And in that context, particularly if you stop the medication and more of the fat mass gets regained, then you, know, you could end up uh, not as well off as you had hoped. And so this is something that is a work in progress. This trial is fully enrolled, small study, 62 patients, but we're doing careful uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, body composition, MRIs, uh, to try to get at this issue of not just how much weight loss there is, but what the distribution of the weight loss is, because it is an important consideration. Um, and then active in uh, ligand traps are known to intervene based on that same target of, of lean mass. And so lean muscle mass is a target that we're interested in studying further um, with an AHA SFRN that was just just uh, just announced. Um, so in terms of the preserved DF landscape, there's all kinds of interventions. I didn't get to some of these in, in studies that are that are either uh, recently completed or underway um, that look at these kind of subgroups. Is it obese HFPF? Is it chronotropically incompetent HFPF? Is it HFPF with peripheral oxygen uptake deficiency? in order to see if we can potentially target some of these subphenotypes beyond what we're seeing with things like SGLT2 inhibition. So I'll conclude uh, here, HFF is increasingly common systemic disease um, for which exercise evaluation may be helpful. Um, encouraging to see the positive clinical trial data. Uh, and we think from subphenotyping patients uh, through careful assessments during exercise and that rank order of deficits, we may be able to uh, further characterize these patients uh, in a meaningful manner. So thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. I know there's an online uh, group too. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And I'm happy to take questions from- start here in the in-person audience and sure. then we can go online. Uh, anybody questions? In the, in the primary care clinic, we see a lot of people with HEFPEF, and um, I see there's definitely a big improvement with uh, exercise. What are 
kind of the recommended exercise guidelines or things we should suggest to them to help uh, their symptoms and outcomes? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. I think that one of the first things that I always try to dispel with these patients is that, you know, the, the concept of what is exercise, right? In, in the conversation I will always have with these patients is you do not have to like, you know, have your gym outfit on with your special sneakers and have like sweat pouring down your face for it to constitute exercise, right? Exercise is like the entire spectrum, right? Exercise is, you know, deciding to, you know, uh, walk up a flight, one flight of stairs instead of taking an elevator or walk for five minutes at a time on your lunch break or, or try to do some activities, particularly this question came up this morning, but particularly patients who are, who are overweight, uh, think about starting with non-weight bearing exercise, even a little, you know, step peddler or a cycle ergometer, things that are su somewhat supporting weight because these patients will run out of, you know, um, energy fast when they're doing activities that involve supporting all their body weight in terms of that exaggerated metabolic cost. If people have access to a uh, to a swimming pool and you can do swimming or water based that helps with the weight as well. Um, and also just this whole concept of starting slow and then keeping records of it. You know, we can do more and more with, you know, with accelerometry uh, devices that people wear, but also just the, um, the idea of just, to, you know, trying to keep track of the, a log of how you're doing, even if it's only increasing by one minute of walking at a time per week. We also do some group activities where we bring together like 10 patients at a time for a group visit um, with some like health coaching about diet and, and exercise and uh, shared kind of experiences between the patients and patients tend to actually really, you know, they like those types of groups. It's actually in conjunction with our, with our primary care colleagues that these got started. Uh, okay. Anybody else here? Yeah. Dr. Lewis, I was really enjoyed this talk. Uh, thank you for giving this. You know, I'm wondering, you showed a table early on of different clinical entities that can present like a hepat phenotype. And we sort of know what all of those things look like in the advanced stage, but sometimes early presentations of diseases like amyloid or HCM yeah. might be hard to diagnose. And so I'm wondering in your referral center, you know, how often does this happen that someone gets labeled with the wastebasket term of hepat and they really have are later found to have something else that can have targeted treatment or how much might that have poisoned the results of some of these clinical trials? Yeah, have? it's a great question. I, I think undoubtedly we've enrolled lots of patients that have the, that laundry list of things. And, you know, there's different, um, I guess there's different ways of approaching these conditions. You know, some, you know, will immediately say, oh, that's not half bath. You know, like let, let's weed, weed these people out, weed these people out. I think about it a little bit differently. I, the patients that come through the uh, my lab, there's pa a lot of patients that have those conditions. And so, and why would we like kind of leave them out? And you know, some of them, like a patient with cardiac amyloidosis, has absolutely has heart failure preserved ejection fraction. They they have some of the worst diastolic function that you ever see. And so, to me, it's you know, can we learn from some of the ways in which these conditions overlap. Of course, there's different targeted treatment. And now, particularly for things that have interventions that work, you know, we know if we find the amyloid earlier, right, we know that tofamidus is gonna work better if we get patients when they're still like, you know, at an earlier uh, degree of their functional decline. Um, so I think your question is a great one in terms of, to me, some of the data I showed this morning was around this can we try to pick up the diagnosis earlier? Some of those patients that come to the lab that have like a steep wedge pressure response or an exercise, it just actually puts us on higher alert to look for those other conditions, right? And then hopefully find some of them earlier before, before just being detected like at the end stage. Because just about everything up there, right? We would be better off um, being able to intervene in an earlier state. So to me, I think we should be thinking about them within the context of this patient evaluation. And frankly, it doesn't necessarily start with like, we are not a uh, half PEF program where we say, oh, you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. No, you're not, all, you know, we, we more kind of start with the patient and with what their symptoms are. And then we try to kind of put them into the, whatever their diagnostic category is. Um, but there are other centers that are like, you know, all half PEF all the time. And they do want to more see the folks that are in that kind of garden variety. 
So I think there's obviously no right or wrong way of doing it. Some of these HEPFEP programs have been terrific in terms of advancing our understanding. Um, but yeah, I think just casting a broad net and frankly, it's great to be here for Department of Medicine Graham Rounds because these are patients that are coming into the primary care clinics or coming into their, their internists. They frankly don't often come and see like the advanced heart failure transplant cardiologists, right? Like they're seen, they're being seen in the community. And a lot of them don't don't come to see cardiologists. So the more that there can be greater awareness of what's happening in half PEF uh, with larger distribution, both directly to patients and to a wider net of providers, then the better off we'll be. I think the question online yeah. uh, is from Dr. Mayer. She's an endocrinologist over at uh, the VA, uh, studies metabolism. Yeah, so I'll read it for a bit. What are your thoughts on effects of beta block 8 on weight gain, especially on non vasodilating beta blockers seen in the Gemini study? Um, does this affect your recommendations when BMI is elevated? Do you preferentially recommend vasodilating beta blockers um, if you if you feel a beta blocker is required? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I think that my practice has been, again, through the lens of seeing what happens to some of these patients where we're essentially dissecting out the FIC equation when they come in for their exercise intolerance, and we find that their heart rate doesn't go above 65% of predicted. And because they're doing a cardiopulmonary exercise test, we actually know that they're doing maximum volitional effort because their respiratory exchange ratio is above 1.05 and they're making a bunch of lactate. Those are patients that have significant chronotropic incompetence. And now we know beyond, you know, concerns about, you know, weight gain, beyond concerns about potential exacerbation of, you know, fatigue and depression and things like that, we know that if you remove a beta blocker from these patients, about 75% of patients with HEPFEF are, are on a beta blocker. Far fewer of those patients actually have some strong indication to actually be on the beta blocker. You know, you can see if someone has SVT all the time, right? Or somebody has like terrible angina and you're trying to, to give them, but the vast majority of these patients don't need to be on a beta blocker. So in my own practice, uh, I found that in patients who don't have an indication for that beta blocker, taking the beta blocker off can help to essentially give them back that component of their FIC equation, uh, particularly when they have shared deficits in their stroke volume because they've got these small stiff hearts that don't generate as much stroke volume as we'd like and abnormalities in their skeletal muscles so that they don't extract oxygen very well. So it's not as simple as, uh, you know, the kind of the, the, you know, if you get a 20 beat per minute higher heart rate and that's a, you know, 15% improvement, your peak VO2 doesn't go up by 15%. And we know from the recent pacing study from the Mayo Clinic that it's not as simple as just making the heart rate go faster with pacing. So I think it's not, it's, you know, I don't want to oversimplify things, but to me, I've seen a lot of patients come back in and be feeling a lot better and be able to do more, particularly those that have this marked chronotropic incompetence. So that's typically the angle I've come at it from. Happy to hear what your thoughts are, uh, Stephanie, in terms of the, the different forms of beta blocker, um, in terms of a vasodilating drug. Uh, to me, these patients, I, I tend, you know, when you've got severe chronotropic incompetence, I just want them off everything nodal. Um, and, and, and when you have a totally normal heart rate response or you have some other strong reason to be on a beta blocker, then it's, it's, it's probably less important. Um, do you follow renin levels when using MRAs? Yeah, again, would, love, would welcome your thoughts on this. That has not been part of uh, my practice historically. I do um, think in these patients that have ejection fractions of 50% or, you know, something we haven't talked about yet is more and more now we have patients that might've had an ejection fraction of 30%, like four years ago, and you meet them and they've got this heart failure recovered ejection fraction. I put those patients invariably on the, on the MRAs as long as they can tolerate them. Um, because I do think we see favorable structural remodeling. We see antifibrotic effects. And so I'm coming at this through the lens of trying to um, improve, uh, you know, kind of cardiac structure and function. And it also helps to, you know, keep the potassium levels up when you've got patients on loop diuretics. So we, we I tend to use quite a bit of MRA in this population, but I don't titrate it to the renin levels. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. I think I see seven. Let me know if you want me to chime in. Of course. Yeah, I was just um, 
one. Are you there, Dr. Mayer? I am. Can you hear me? Uh, let me turn that up. Sorry. Got the brief comment. Go ahead. We'll try to get your audio up. All right. Tell me, does that work? Yeah, I, I, we can hear you. Okay, great. No, I just want to say thank you. I, I totally um, agree. And there's also some data that using non- vasodilating, you know, the older metoprolol, atenolol, propranolol negatively impacts insulin resistance uh, and worsened lipids. And there's some, there's some data to suggest that maybe you're having less um, uh, perfusion uh, and, and uh, that's also contributing to some of the, uh, the weight gain that, it, that is seen um, and, and uh, worsened um, uh, potential risk for glucose, which can then have you know, toxicities and, and uh, end glycated uh, products. So that's another reason wherever possible, um, of course, from a specifically weight perspective, would recommend avoiding beta blockade um, and off alpha blockade whenever possible. From an aldosterone perspective, we tend to, when we have determined that a patient has hyperaldosteronism uh, and they do not wish to pursue uh, workup for, or don't wanna undergo surgery and they wanna be medically managed, we typically use, there's some data to suggest that using renin as your marker that you're aiming for and targeting a renin level of one and higher uh, for patients with hyperaldosteronism, uh, that that is uh, helpful uh, in terms of outcomes. So it could be an outcome measure to consider. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for both of those comments. I think we have time for one more. Does anybody have any other comments? Yes. So, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, what's your practice using GLP-1 now in the HFET population? Is it one of the JDMC like medications that we reach out to early or like you try like a, maybe an exercise program and weight loss program? Yeah, yeah like, no, thanks for the question. I, I, you know, admittedly, I'm still in the you know, early stages. I don't consider there may be experts on this call and, uh, you know, metabolism and, and, you know, weight centers and things that have a ton of experience with them. I don't. Uh, some of my experience has been dictated by who I can get the drug covered for. And so, you know, in patients who have diabetes, uh, it's been much easier uh, to get them on it. But some of these patients are, they're desperately seeking ways to feel better. And so I think when we, you know, take into context the results of the step hef -PEF study, the results of SELECT, um, and you have somebody that's significantly overweight and highly symptomatic, um, I have been trying to get these patients on to treatments, but fully realizing that we're not going to, you know, I, that I don't think this is like the, the final stopping point here. Um, a lot of patients do voice reservations about the idea of like, well, what happens next? You know, obviously you got to take, it takes a while to titrate them up. And then it's like, then what, you know, do I, am I on this indefinitely? So that's why we're actively investigating some of these simultaneous pathways, but also importantly, um, it's not done in isolation. I really try to get these patients uh, to be part of a program that's going to do as much as possible to preserve lean muscle mass by having them engage in uh, aerobic exercise training, resistance training, because there's a recognition of the fact that already these patients will oftentimes have sarcopenic obesity. And then on top of that, you're causing them to potentially lose lean mass. So I try to take, do it as part of a kind of a concerted approach to, to, essentially identifying their deficits and trying to correct as many of them as you can. All right. Thank you so much. Dr. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. It. Thank you so much. Welcome. This is, uh, yeah, everything worked out. Fine.